Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to join us at this dr drowning prevention and treatment meeting. My name is uh, Jenny Smith. I am a, a reader in performance psychology and a member of the um, Occupational Performance Research Group at the University of Chichester. And I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, for the day, uh, chairing a really exciting set of presentations. I'm looking forward to sharing them uh, all with you guys. I want to thank the Physiological Society uh, for all the work that they have done in putting the conference together and for IDRA as well, the International Drowning Researchers Alliance for um, helping us put this together as well. Very specifically, thank you to Sarah, Simon and Caitlin from the Physiological Society and my friends Mike, Aidy and Paddy for helping with the um, organising of the conference and doing a lot of work in that area. And we are very pleased to welcome uh, speakers from 13 countries and uh, delegates from 38 countries. So I'm really pleased that we're having some impact and we can start to uh, share our research and the things that we're doing with a wider drowning prevention community. And I'm really delighted to, that there are so many people here uh, with us today. And first up, we have got um, Thomas Wilde. And I'm hoping that Thomas can uh, is with us. Oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, so I'm presenting Floating Point, a new method to establish the motionless airway freeboard of humans in water to advise on drowning risk and self-rescue actions. I'm currently a postgraduate student um, at Leeds Trinity University, supervised by uh, Professor Martin Barwood and colleagues. Um, so I'm here to present a project a topic about floating. So floating is a behavioural activity for self-rescue on sudden immersion into cold water if caught in a rip current to reduce heat loss and energy expenditure and as a fallback if unable to continue swimming. In the UK, this is collectively known as float to live. So that is uh, safety advice um, to help uh, those who get into difficulty in water. Uh, this image to the right here shows uh, the back float position. A precise definition of uh, floating incorporating elements that we think are important, we've not found yet. So for this project, we're using remaining at the surface of the water uh, and um, using the minimal activity required to um, sort of maintain airway clearance above the water uh, to, to enable breathing. Airway freeboard, which is uh, including in the title and later in this presentation, uh, is the distance of the airway from the surface of the water uh, shown here. So why back floating? So the advice is to relax and use the minimal activity required to achieve uh, and maintain flotation on sudden immersion into cold water. So floating actually uh, potentially helps this as it could be the most uh, efficient survival position in the absence of a life jacket. So previous research has shown that the oxygen uptake uh, for maintaining floating in, in a treading water position uh, is 0.9 to 2 litres a minute. However, back floating, based on our observations in our current study, is likely to be lower than this, so it's potentially more efficient. And this may be best explained from an anatomical and biomechanical perspective. So humans are limited by the position of the airway, which is at the base of the head. So in a back float position, essentially you can offload some of your volume into the water, reducing the sinking force. Uh, so when the body is in water, there are two opposing forces acting upon it, uh, body mass, which acts downwards, and the uh, upward force, uh, the buoyant force. Um, when a body is immersed in water, um, it, uh, Sorry, flotation occurs if the density of the body is lower than the density of the water, based on Archimedes' principle of buoyancy, okay? So this means that uh, the buoyant force uh, offsets the body mass force suspending the body in place. Uh, density is mass divided by volume. Therefore, the exact point at which a body floats um, depends upon the density, um, the distribution, sorry, of the body volume. And so we uh, say this is the first point of equilibration. In most cases, these forces act through slightly different locations. So you see here, center of mass, center of buoyancy. Um, and essentially the body rotates until the center of buoyancy is above the center of mass. And previous research has showed that increased weight in water decreases the, uh, increases, sorry. Sorry. Previous research has showed that increased weight in water increased the uh, cost of floating. So leaner and more athletic populations 
have a greater body density, which increases their weight in water. We believe this would increase their reliance on body movements, clothing, and or buoyancy aids to offset um, this uh, sinking force and maintain flotation during survival situations for which floating are advised. Identifying differences in floating points between people and water conditions has been quite difficult previously because we could not quantify the differences in the distribution of the volume of the body. However, uh, 3D body scanning uh, now enables this. The method described in this presentation relates to the data collected for an ongoing project. So we are very much just uh, starting the process of data analysis. Today, I'm talking through the method uh, we've used and providing an example of its uses. The project in general has three hypotheses. Firstly, with 3D scanning, we expect that um, it provides quite a reliable and valid measure of body volume, uh, which we can use to estimate body uh, buoyancy, et cetera. We expect to find that the floating point is proportionally greater for males uh, than females, and those also with greater body density. Lastly, we expect that the physiological cost of bat floating to be greater in males and those with greater body density. As this project is ongoing, I can't test or reject any of these today, uh, but I look forward to being able to share that information at some later point. Okay, so we can now calculate differences in flotation by measuring the uh, floating point on a volumetrically representative 3D scanned human body. Typically, 3D scanning involves LiDAR or structured light methods. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we've used structured light. Uh, essentially, it projects a light pattern onto the surface uh, of an object and uh, its distortion around contours is captured to, uh, to produce a point cloud and polygonal mesh. Uh, so to the right of the slide, you see a GIF, which shows the general process and uh, the breakdown of information, how it's produced. For our study, we've used the handheld Arctic EVA scanning device, which produces a high definition 3D body model. For our setup, we scanned participants in the anatomical position. Uh, to prevent arm movement, they held orthopedic walking sticks, so you'll notice it's not in the photo. Uh, and there were three components to each scan. Um, basically, we did the full body scan with the orth orthopedic walking sticks. Then we scanned the bottom of the feet separately and also the hands separately as well. Um, these, the hands and feet were later joined um, at the narrowest cross section and also matched for limb segment length to the full body model. Uh, the screen behind here shows the general uh, data being recorded at the time of the uh, scan. In the middle, you see the initial output. So the left shows the number of capture frames, which is typically about one to 2,000. And the right shows pieces of the scan, which were later joined up. Post-processing involves a series of uh, generic steps to render a volumetrically representative 3D body model shown here to the right, and some uh, information here generated from the model, uh, in particular the volume and surface area, uh, weights from uh, force plate, and then density is calculated from a combination of those two things. Our preliminary insights show good agreement between hydrostatic weighing and 3D body scanning for the estimation of body volume. Once we have our body scan, we can import it into another piece of software that enables us to do a series of steps to fit and manipulate a skeleton uh, using joints, essentially. So you see here this yellow skeleton, I've tilted the head, I've rotated the hands, and the resulting volume change was 0.05%, so extremely small. And this uh, became our horizontal model. So after some scaling in another piece of software, the body was imported back into the original software to conduct the measurements along with the vertical model. The uh, following slides provide some values for one person, and this is essentially just reporting the method we're using. The floating point was calculated by working out the proportion of uh, body volume buoyed above the surface of water based on relative density. So here we have maximal lung volume, a mid lung volume. So mid is essentially just tidal breathing. For the max, the participant was asked to breathe, uh, fully inflate their lungs and then breathe shallow breaths at maximal lung volume purely due to the length of the time taken to do the scan. On the model, you can see green bands. Uh, these are the floating points at different water densities. Uh, 
Um, previous float first research showed that participants maintained around five centimeters of airway freeboard, so the distance of the airway from the surface of the water. So we use this essentially as a comfortable uh, freeboard value, and then, which enables us to do subsequent measurements, for example, sinking force uh, shown to the right here. So based on this comfortable freeboard value, the sinking force was greater in fresh than in sinking uh, seawater. And to contextualize this, winter clothing provides around 45 newtons of additional buoyancy, summer clothing, seven newtons, an entry level uh, flotation device might provide around 50 newtons. Here we have maximal lung volume and mid lung volume, uh, this time in the back float position. So you'll perhaps notice that the values are more favorable in the back float position compared to vertical floating. Uh, so the sinking force in seawater uh, was entirely negated by adopting a back float position and an 81% reduction in sinking force in uh, fresh water. Therefore, back floating with head immersion minimizes the sinking force and the energy cost of floating. So this would appear to support recent research by the University of Portsmouth, which found that immersing the back of the head improved uh, the uh, float to live advice. Fresh water provides uh, less buoyant force, increasing the reliance on clothing uh, movements, aids to offset the sinking force and maintain flotation. So based on uh, reading around the topic, it's been quite difficult to quantify differences uh, based on these different water environments, which I think shows the value of this new method. And uh, essentially it can also be applied to investigate differences between people based on their characteristics, such as their biological sex, ethnicity, age, etc. The key points are that floating is a measure that can be used to investigate factors that influence human flotation in water. And back floating appears to be the most efficient survival position in the absence of a life jacket. Therefore, advising people to back float may improve their survival chances. Fresh water may be an underappreciated risk factor for unintentional drowning, particularly for people with greater body density with potential implications for drowning prevention in inland waters. Uh, ideas for developing the research. So part one is essentially we've uh, val been validating 3D body scanning for the measurement of a floating point to produce a kind of reproducible method and we're confirming factors that influence uh, the cost of floating and uh, essentially the maintenance of it. Uh, in part two, we aim to develop a prediction equation for floating point um, to work out differences based on uh, population values for different groups and water environments. Um, and then we uh, also, yeah, potentially um, advise, produce population values, sorry, for different groups and water environments. And this may help us to sort of advise on groups who may have an increased reliance on additional buoyancy to maintain flotation. Uh, thanks for listening. Welcome, everybody. This is a bit of a, um, information about what did Surf Life Saving do during the pandemic of COVID-2020. I uh, certainly want to say thank you to some colleagues on here, which is Mike Tipton uh, and Dr. Patrick Morgan. Uh, certainly without their work during this response um, and knowing how phonetic it was in those early times, we would not have done the kind of uh, output that we hopefully talk through today. So uh, my thanks to them in ensuring um, that this was enabling people to stop, you know, basically uh, be able to survive and not have risks that we saw during this pandemic. So just sorry, just be computer glitch. On January 2020 UK, at the end of the month on January 30th, COVID-19 was announced as a viral pandemic. And we kind of saw this around the world, really. And it constantly was involving with a lot of intelligence and, and on the impact of, of people, public life, and what we can and couldn't do. And that actually at the start of that period, we started uh, chats as the three of us and other people uh, to try and understand this situation, knowing that this could be a problem to our volunteer service and the safety of beaches and coastal areas. By the time we got to the 24th of March, certainly there was a UK uh, entered in its massive lockdown, and that certainly uh, allowed us to really gather as much information as we could. 
the problem we had then on the 10th of May was on with the government setting out what their parameters were, was the quote uh, from our prime minister at the time saying more outdoor activity will be allowed in England, included unlimited exercise trips to beauty such, such as beaches. And by saying that at the dispatch box in Parliament, we all knew uh, as a group of us that we'd almost unleashed uh, the gates of hell, knowing that we had fantastic summer predictions of warm weather. But also we knew around this time that we were going to see some major spring uh, tides or king tides, if we use that term, from around the world. And we knew that this risk was uh, going to be landing on our doorstep. So the problem was this. The professional lifeguard service ha had ceased because they themselves were trying to deal with understanding the risks and what was going on. And, and that led to people being um, furloughed and not being able to produce a, a lifeguard service in a professional level. Because of the statement made at the at this dispatch box, we saw an influence of beach users. And its photograph on the right hand side really shows the kind of level of people going outside to go and be being stuck indoors to now going outside, enjoying the, what was fantastic weather that time um, and trying to just get some fresh air and meeting up with people who hadn't been seen for a number of weeks and months. But that really massively significantly put the massive pressure on the risk of drowning. And it's here at Surf Lifesaving that we suddenly realised that we needed some work to be done in preparedness for this to ensure that we identified the risks and also to understand how we're going to make sure that we are not getting ourselves into a situation where we're transmitting a risk of disease or getting ourselves where we are in a situation where we're losing any life-saving cover at all whatsoever on our beaches and not also passing that on to our community from which our lifeguards come from. This actually led to what we call the biggest mobilization of life volunteer lifeguard service in the history of surf lifesaving. And certainly um, it meant a huge big wheel had to turn. And the start of that turning was the fact that we were very good in our clinical group to make sure that what could we do, what couldn't we do, and effectively picking the low hanging fruit to ensure that there was a service there that would stop people getting into difficulty in water, but also minimize the uh, situation of risk to the lifesavers and lifeguards. And that certainly meant about actually prevention work. And we saw from yesterday with Dr. David Spillman, about 99.9% .9 of people uh, are put away from the, the rescue situation by preventative action. And this is where we took the low hanging fruit from in ensuring that how do we keep our lifeguards safe? How do we ensure that they're not doing rescues? And how we make sure that when they finish their day patrolling, that they certainly could go home relatively safely with some checks and measures and some policy. So how do we do this this wheel? How do we turn this big engine uh, in a matter of weeks to get ready for this uh, 2020 summer? Well, the first phase of that was the training. And, and over a two week intense period, we contacted 70 of our clubs online and we did huge, big um, online presentation on COVID risk, mitigation, surveillance strategies, which we were using science from uh, our host today, Dr. Jenny Smith and, and Mike Tipton to learn about surveillance and how we're going to match that into the governance and the policy and keeping our people safe. And that turned out to be what we call the Beach Wardens uh, Service, which where we were doing preventative work, but really limited any chance of any rescue that we would uh, try and be involved with. And a lot of that was talking and meeting people at safe distance. We the recordings were shared within the clubs. And so making sure that all the trainer assessors that we had spoken to and the club committees, all this was then shared and, and disseminated out towards the volunteer service. Our next phase was the volunteering and making sure that that our beach wardens could deliver the service that required. And that meant a lot of work we're looking with local authorities to inform not only that we could get COVID uh, PPE uh, in place, but we didn't look like a lifeguard service because we couldn't guarantee as volunteers uh, that that service could be there every single day. And the balance of being there and being visible, but not looking like a lifeguard service, but having a lifeguard service in effect, meant that we were not confusing the professional lifeguard service and at the same time providing good uh, safety advice to the members of the public. So we donned high-vis orange tabards to be seen clearly uh, with the work that we're doing. And that led to a good public awareness and also understood of the capabilities and limitations of what we were able to provide. The third part was the incident reports that came through, and that was broken into four major areas, uh, basic first aid, major first aid, 
assistance and intervention. And that is basically stopping people from a bad place into a good place. And that could be anybody waist deep, waist depth from a rip, tide, uh, a rip current, sorry, to an or going under, working under rocks or whatever. And then obviously the rescue, which was quite important, where we identified that there may be rescues to be made and we may have to break protocols for that. But nonetheless, we'd have to provide that service. The results were staggering in that year. 140 representatives, representatives spent five hours online learning, covering 700 hours, effectively average of 30 persons per club cascading that training, which led to 10,500 volunteer hours. Staggering. And the patrols were mainly in the southwest, but certainly around Norfolk and the areas of the south coast and east coast and up towards the edges of uh, South Wales. This led to a huge average of four patrols per club for about six hours with about four people in each patrol and 32 clubs were involved. Totaling uh, 147,000 hours plus during that one period of time. The interventions, uh, as you can see from this report, was basic first aids was uh, five, major first aid incidents were 16. And the interventions, which is I think, absolutely staggering, was nearly 3,000 uh, in that part. 28 missing persons, and where we had to break government protocol, actually we had to make 136 rescues, live saved, effectively. Conclusions from this is collaborative working with local councils and statutory services, and a novel approach to volunteer training um, was really, really important. You know, the total work for the total period of the time was over 3,000 interventions. Success recognised by inclusion of the National Water Safety Forum publication, which is the maintaining the safety of the public and staff on coastal beaches, really showed what a small group of volunteers can do that have a significant impact to the public safety during that period of time. And that certainly carried on into the 2021 period as well. This video is now going to play, and we hope you enjoy this video, uh, which is a thank you uh, done by two organisations, Carve Surf Magazine and uh, one of the local um, beer manufacturers. But this is a video they put out to say thank you to the volunteer service in the southwest.
Um, so I hope you enjoyed that little bit of a video. Cool. And here's our, just our references. I just want to say a huge big thank you to Surf Life Saving Volunteer Lifeguards and their lifesavers, the committees involved. And a very big thank you to uh, Dr. Morgan and Professor Mike Tipton. Without their insight and working together collaboratively with the local authorities, the statutory services, um, as you can probably see, that number of 3,000 people would probably not be 3,000 people going home to their families, but 3,000 deaths and drownings that may have occurred. My thanks to you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm Victoria Laxton. I'm a human factors researcher at Transport Research Laboratory. I'm going to talk to you about something a little bit different today from drowning prevention. Um, and this is fatigue detection trials that were conducted on London buses. And then I'm going to talk about how the lessons learned from these trials and the technology itself could be adopted and adapted into lifeguarding to create a better culture around managing fatigue in the lifeguarding domain. So to begin with, I'll just give you a little bit of context about why it might be possible to transfer those lessons learned from buses to lifeguards and what links these two very different tasks of driving and lifeguarding. So if we go into the underlying cognitive mechanisms of both of those tasks, they're very similar in terms of, um, they both require things like sustained attention, visual search and hazard perception and prediction to name but a few. And all of these can contribute to mental fatigue particularly when they've been maintained through um, long periods of times or through uncomfortable environments like heat or during kind of shift patterns, so early mornings and late nights, just like bus drivers and lifeguards. In terms of what fatigue is, um, this is classed as a feeling of extreme tiredness, and this is both mental fatigue and physical fatigue. I'm gonna concentrate on the mental fatigue today and this can affect things like our ability to concentrate, our decision-making processes, and our problem-solving skills. And the negative consequences of uh, fatigue include things like decreased um, performance, where we can't perform to the best of our abilities, and then increased safety risks. Uh, so this can lead to more accidents or errors when driving or lifeguarding. Um, in terms of fatigue for drivers, there's been an abundance of research into what fatigue in driving is, what it may look like and how to mitigate it, which means that technology to improve driver safety is growing at rapid speeds. Um, and this means that we can understand and spot the signs of driver fatigue. So this includes things like yawning, frequent blinking, um, difficulty focusing on the road, and then things like poor car control, or poor decision making. So now you have a little bit of context around what fatigue is. Um, I'll briefly talk about the trials that we conducted on London buses and specifically a couple of tasks that were conducted in the preparation of these trials. And then I'll talk about the lessons learned from these activities and how these could be relevant for similar trials if they were conducted in uh, lifeguarding domains. So there were two tasks that were uh, conducted in the preparation of these trials, and this was a market review of available technologies, and then a review of fatigue management plans and best practice. So the first task was the review of available technology on the market, and this identified 15 products that were suitable for buses, and these fitted into three categories, so wearable tech, which was things like glasses, um, EEG headbands, and then uh, wristband type smartwatches. There were camera-based monitoring systems, and I think most of these were these camera systems. And these are placed on the dashboard in front of the driver or somewhere within the cab. And these use face recognition technology and AI to detect the signs of fatigue. So that excessive yawning, um, eyes off the road time, eye closure and things like that. And then there was mobile apps. So this was things like cognitive tests or um, detecting fatigue from your speech pattern. So in terms of 
which of these could be adapted for lifeguards. The wearable tech and the mobile apps probably not suitable for a direct transition into lifeguarding. Um, for the wearable tech, this is probably the most problematic as it can be quite invasive and it's probably also not waterproof if a lifeguard has to go in and make a rescue. And by invasive, I mean it could be quite bulky and could get in the way when conducting a rescue. Um, this was also the least favoured in previous trials by bus drivers as people don't really like having to wear additional things um, in conjunction with their uniforms. And then the mobile apps are also probably difficult to translate straight into lifeguarding as these need to be conducted prior to a shift or prior to a rotation. And for lifeguarding, it may mean that lifeguards are feeling quite refreshed when they first enter their rotation after having just had a break, but then towards the end of their 20 minutes, 30 minutes on poolside, that's when they start to show their signs of fatigue. Um, so the one that is probably most adaptable for lifeguarding is the camera-based monitoring systems. Um, I don't think this would be a, a straight kind of pick it up from a car and put it onto a lifeguard. Um, there'll probably be need to be some considerations into the metrics used to measure fatigue. So with the abundance of research for drivers, we know what the signs of fatigue are. But for lifeguarding, this perhaps hasn't been researched as much. So things like yawning and frequent blinking probably do transfer from driving into lifeguarding. But things like eyes off the road time is probably not a direct comparison to eyes off the pool time as a sign of fatigue. Um, so a little bit more research into kind of what those signs are for lifeguarding may be needed. In terms of how the technologies work, most of them offer real-time alerts, either visually, um, audio, or through haptic vibrations. And alerts can also be sent to an additional user, so someone like a manager or a supervisor who could then go check on the well-being of the lifeguard. In terms of the challenges of su and successes of the previous trials, um, there was low acceptance rates to begin with, with drivers um, not being keen on being monitored and feeling like they were being watched in a Big Brother style. And one of the ways to overcome this was to provide the drivers with education and a chance to fully ask questions and understand how the system was being used and um, how their data was also being used. Uh, previous trials have also shown a, pro a positive impact of the introduction of technology, and this is through a greater awareness of how fatigue can be managed and how it impacts their safety. So in terms of how this would translate to lifeguarding, if it was introduced, it may mean that lifeguards could better understand their own patterns of fatigue. So for example, it may be that a lifeguard is feeling fatigued every day around lunchtime, and for them to better manage this, it would be taking their lunch break a little bit early earlier. Um, so the second kind of preparation task that we conducted for the bush trials was a review of fatigue risk management plans. And these plans are put in place by organizations where fatigue is a risk for safety, uh, productivity and well-being, and are usually used to assess the risk fatigue can pose and then subsequently reduce those risks. Uh, they are particularly important in industries with shift work settings, so things like the transportation industry, uh, healthcare, and then will be very relevant for an industry like lifeguarding. Uh, in this review, we also looked at the best practice guidelines. And this guidance um, on how to implement a fatigue risk management plan has been developed for the Energy Institute and is widely recognized as best practice in the fatigue risk management field. Um, it's not essential for a fatigue risk management plan to include all 10 of these elements, but there are some suggestions based on best practice for other safety critical industries. And just to highlight a few of these 10 elements, uh, they include things like education and promotion around training and awareness within fatigue, um, management of health issues that could influence fatigue, and then things like a statement of standard working hours, uh, overtime limits, and considerations into uh, circadic rhythms. 
The review of the fatigue management best practice highlighted the importance of a good fatigue management risk policy. Um, and this helps create an understanding around what fatigue is and how it could be managed by all parties. This includes things like manager and supervisor training to ensure they are able to assist in identifying if a colleague is fatigued and then provide the correct guidance and advice to mitigate that fatigue. These plans are essentially designed to help everyone within the organization understand their own responsibilities when it comes to fatigue. Uh, one of the important things that came out of the review is that drivers are not punished for being fatigued under these policies, but instead the policies are used as a tool to mitigate the effects of fatigue. So following a fatigue event, uh, this plan would be put into action and fatigue would then be fully considered during an incident investigation. Um, so the lessons learned and just to conclude and bring it all together. So the technology review identified that wearable tech um, is least favorable by drivers. And this was found in previous trials where tech has been introduced. And this is due to drivers not wanting to wear additional things in conjunction with their uniforms. And a low acceptance rate of systems was also found to be a challenge, but education was key to overcoming this. And then acceptance rates, rates um, improved to nearly 100%. Um, also the positive kind of benefits of this technology being introduced was greater awareness of how to manage, um, fatigue and understanding the impact fatigue can have on safety. And then from the fatigue risk management plan and best practice review, one of the most important findings was that nobody is punished for being fatigued. Uh, nobody can be sacked for being fatigued. Uh, we all are susceptible to fatigue, for fatigue, so uh, these plans are more used as a risk assessment to mitigate the effects of fatigue and also open a dialogue to improve uh, personal management and then staff health and well-being. And in terms of lifeguarding, I think at the minute there is no conversation around uh, fatigue in lifeguarding. It's a very bad thing if a lifeguard uh, falls asleep while on duty. So I think the introduction of these fatigue risk management plans would be a good introduction and would help open that dialogue about how to better manage fatigue and how everyone in the organization can take steps to mitigate uh, the effects of fatigue. And there's been, I think, positive uh, use of these plans in other industries as well. So we can learn lessons from not only transport, but healthcare and aviation. So I just want to say thank you for listening and then also thank you to the team listed here who are part of the um, pre-trial activities I've spoken about today. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, um, so hi everybody, uh, my name is Nick Spence. I'm the uh, Standards Management NARA, the National Ambulance Resilience Unit, which is based in um, England in the UK and we cover the 10 English ambulance services and look after the national interoperable uh, capabilities for those. Um, I'm not here to talk about that, I'm here to talk about uh, the, uh, the submersion uh, decision supporting tool really. Um, this is around um, a number of issues that have been raised in England through a system called JOL, that's the Joint Organisational Learning platform. Uh, this is used by uh, the emergency services and the LRF, LRF, the Local Resilience Forum Partners, and I apologise with the acronyms. Um, please pull me up on them uh, if I'm using too many of them. Uh, for, for the international colleagues that are joining, they won't know necessarily what, what they all mean, so I do apologise in advance. Um, but this system is where uh, responders can post lessons, um, identified good practice, as well as areas that need improvement. Um, and then that is shared across, across all the emergency service responders and organizations. Uh, under that sits a JOL board and they look at these, review these lessons that have been submitted. And lessons such as the one that have popped onto the screen there, identify that the water survivability model um, to ensure 
uh, kind of standardized approach um, was creating some issues in its application. And that was really based on um, the, the interpretation of it as, as, as long as a number of other lessons that were identified at the same time as well. And this was such as uh, people guarding trouble night and reporting a body in the water rather than a person in the water, because that was influencing the emergency service response to that incident as well. So a number of lessons were, came out of that, and that was created and put into an action note. Um, and one of those uh, was that all responder organisations uh, need to promote the awareness of the Joint Rural Colleges Ambulance Liaison Committee, GR Calc, survivability and water model, um, and align that with the JDM, the Joint Decision Model, which the emergency services use as part of their JESIP, and apologies, JESIP stands for the Joint Emergency Services Interoperable Principles, um, or uh, as it is now. Um, and this was really in relation to inland freshwater uh, response to people who are reported as submerged in the water. Okay, apologies for that, folks. Right, back to where we were with um, the, the action note that came out. So, so this was around um, the survivability model and its application and its interpretation of it. Uh, and that was one of the concerns raised around this and the promoting the awareness across all the emergency responders on the JR Calc model. Um, and this is the one that was uh, published in JR Calc. So this was developed many number of years ago by, by uh, a group of esteemed colleagues that know a lot more about drowning and a number of them are actually on this, uh, uh, on this conference call. So um, uh, I will not do them any form of disservice uh, by not giving credit to uh, folks outside uh, my sphere certainly and, and obviously JR, JR Calc was just one conduit that was promoting and using this tool um, and JR Calc as, as a joint Royal colleges ambulance liaison committee just for our colleagues internationally is the platform that is used by all ambulance service paramedics and contains all their clinical guidelines um, within that platform so this is this is the area that a paramedic would go to uh, and help inform them or an ambulance commander on scene <coughs> with regard to uh, their response to a drowning person and specifically with the use of this tool for somebody who is submerged. Uh, and this follows a time wheel and a kind of decision points uh, to be able to undertake analytical risk assessments and such like as that. So the mandate that came out, uh, out of the group that went away to look at all of the different elements of the uh, the the Joel action note, um, because as I said, it included things such as the communication between emergency control rooms and also the, uh, the terminology used such as body of water and such like, included uh, this option six, which, which was to re-establish a single version of the inland water survivability model. Now, then it came to me as NARA led. So that's where I got involved and really to coordinate uh, this this uh, response to this. So, process really that, that was undertaken then was to have a look at the issue because you know people are talking about this being a problem, but you know what kind of scale is the problem? To then review the clinical evidence to see what there is out there. Has anything changed since the model uh, was uh, developed and introduced? Engage with stakeholders. Look at the design. Uh, if it needs redesign, they're not at all. Test that. Review and re review and redraft that if it is required, and then obviously if with any changes, uh, update and uh, stakeholders, including um, people such as the chief coroner and such like, produce and disseminate that, and then uh, obviously, uh, like all of these things, um, where you've uh, mitigated one risk or concern, there's a great potential to create others. So to identify any further work that needs doing as a result of that. So surely there's just one tool because it's pretty straightforward. You, you drop down, your person submerged. When you turn up on scene, you start the clock and you follow that around. Uh, it turned out that the tool that was obviously um, had been taken by different responders, organizations, and like anything, they put their own um, uh, interpretation on it and to make it specific to their organizational needs and requirements. Um, so the, the, I suppose the concern there then was at three o'clock in the morning, if you've got a, a fire ambulance um, policeman um, 
volunteer sector responders all stood around on the bank side looking at their versions of the same tool. Are they looking at the same one? And the answer was, although on first glance they look the same, um, and fundamentally the content is exactly the same, so it shouldn't make any difference, but they are looking at different tools. And in fact, one of the organizations quite cleverly um, turned the wheel from anti-clockwise to clockwise because it represents the passage of time, so it makes sense that it goes clockwise. However, I suppose the concern was um, everyone's got a bit of a different slant on the same tool, although the content is fundamentally the same. Is that causing issues at three o'clock in the morning or isn't it? Because the Joel uh, lessons uh, are rolling in about the issues with responding to these incidents. Now, bearing in mind, the, in the UK, the, the response to somebody who was drowned in inland waters is a true multi-agency response. Um, it involves all the organisations, not just uh, blue light responders um, and the voluntary sector, uh, as well as um, other elements as well. So it's normally quite an emotional response as well, you know, because, but, but as you will all be aware with regard to the, the demographic of people that get into trouble in the water and are reported as missing or submerged or drowned, etc. So it's, it is quite a complex area. So where we can simplify things, we try to do so. So after identifying, reviewing that, yeah, potentially there is a bit of a problem because there isn't just one version of the model out there. Uh, there's numbers of that. Uh, we undertook a number of stakeholder meetings. So we had four national meetings uh, with key stakeholders with regard to the work that we were suggesting doing and looking at. Now, this was after we'd undertaken a clinical review and, and put a, a clinical group together to look at the science, the evidence behind it, what new research is out there versus the research that was uh, in place when the model was developed. And the short answer to that is there's nothing really new out there to make any changes significantly to the tool. But then that in itself is, is quite telling that things haven't specifically changed since that. So it's not that the tool is wrong, it's just perhaps it's the application of the tool that there's potentially some issues with. And that means either the tool isn't fit for purpose or it's not fit for those organizational purposes, etc. So we looked at a couple of options and we redrafted the tool uh, into the to the image you can see on the left hand side, taking it away from the wheel concept, uh, introducing the icons that are used for uh, decision making of considerations, and the national kind of Jessup terminology with JDM standing for joint decision model and DRA for dynamic risk assessment, ARA for analytical risk assessment, um, and in the box putting in some of the text which in the first iteration of the tool. Uh, had been lost. That was sitting generally as footnotes, but when people had taken the tool and copied it, they didn't take the footnotes with them specifically was one of the issues that we potentially found. So that was redrafted into the, the, the graphic that you see on the left. The content was then redrafted um, and it's exactly the same content on, uh, into the right-hand iteration just to provide a different colored version, but the same tool shape that people have been using for a little while. Um, so arguably, it's a good point then to say, well, OK, well, we'll just pick one and push that out and tell everybody, all the responding agencies, this is the new tool. This is what you have to use. OK, um, now, for those of you that are astute and seen uh, notice uh, any content in with it, hey, you've got better eyesight than I. Uh, apologies, because the, uh, the screen sharing is not working particularly well for me. Um, but one of the things that we did do was tweak the icy cold, the sub six degree water forward from 90 minutes, uh, sorry, 60 minutes to uh, 30 minute consideration. So uh, that was really the only kind of clinical fundamental change that we we're making to the tool. Um, but instead of saying, right, this is the one tool, everybody go out and use it. Um, what we did do is we commissioned uh, the United Kingdom Health uh, Security Agency, uh, their Behavioral Science and Insights Unit to come in and give us an independent kind of review as to what and how the tool was being interpreted because it's all well, well and good me sitting in, in a conference, sitting in, uh, in an office deciding this is what we're going to do. It's not me out there at three o'clock in the morning applying this tool that, um, under Torchlight on the banks of the river. So uh, they came in and they undertook uh, some fo focus groups with responder agencies, uh, including police ambulance, fire and rescue service, 
uh, His Majesty's Coast Guard, mounted rescue representatives and uh, representatives of the RNLI. Now, I fully appreciate there's a lot more responder agencies that are out there at three o'clock in the morning, sit on the bank side. Um, but we obviously, uh, they couldn't engage with every single um, re water responder team in the country, unfortunately. So it was a case of trying to get a dip sample to see how they interpret the information that is on the tool. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, the participants covered not just England, although that's our area of operation, um, but they covered, uh, they included representatives from Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, the participants themselves, they, their, their experience range from just a few years um, to up to, to quite extensive experience. Uh, and indeed their um, response level from an operator uh, through to a commander was represented as well. Um, and what we wanted to do was not just have all the water experts in the room because they, they read the subtext, they read in between the titles as to regard to actually, if you're a brand new paramedic straight out of the box and you're given this tool to look at, what does it mean to you? How are you interpreting it? So we, we wanted to make sure there was some um, not very experienced, as well as experienced responders within those groups, uh, and they were able to do that. So that report actually was returned last week. So we haven't got to the end of this journey, but it's really this an opportunity to, to update you all as to where we are with it um, and, and how that's going. So the results are in uh, from, from uh, the UKHSA, um, and it's thematic around the perceptions of the tools. Um, the ones that were used previously versus, uh, and also then they can contrast and compare against the ones that uh, have been developed. Uh, people's confidence in that, looking at the language, the content, purpose, the design and layout, and people's, people's real uh, interpretation of it. And we're still getting some issues around people's interpretation. Is this a resuscitation tool or is it a search and rescue tool? So is that, does this tell us when we uh, need to stop searching or um, uh, other elements of how people interpret that? So we've got some work to do now to go away and kind of assimilate the, the feedback that we've had with regard to that um, uh, and to look at those results. Um, that's really the position that we're in at the moment. So this is to go away, look at the results, look at the feedback we've had from the responding agencies. Um, as required, we'll redraft the tool uh, to, to take into account all of those considerations. It'll then be a case of back out stakeholders, Resuscitation Council UK, as well as the Chief Coroner and other key stakeholders, uh, to then finally produce the next, this next generation of this tool, where it will be uh, disseminated uh, for all to adopt. And one of the potential concepts is to make sure that there is scope within that tool that if agencies have specific information they want to put in to support it, um, they can do so without actually affecting the key tool itself. So at three o'clock in the morning, everyone's looking at the same tool, but they've got the ability to, to have their own organizational supplementary information available to them at the same time. So we're going to look at how we can potentially do that as well. Uh, and this is really key around risk appetite uh, organizationally as well as individually. Um, of which you can't really measure um, specifically in advance. So uh, the, the ability to flex uh, whilst remaining that core principle is required as well. So we just need to be cognizant of that. Further elements, we're talking about uh, joint operators and principal, principals, jobs, as they're called over here, which we have for a number of key responses in the UK and across England for specific types of incidents, such as a marauding terrorist attack. So should we have one for drowning? Um, should we have a national drowning training material repository, a library where people can draw all the information they need for training uh, for all for first responders, as well as private providers, uh, commercial providers, etc., to ensure that the people are using common language and have a common approach based on the most up-to-date data and uh, consensus with regard to the, the response to drowning patients. Um, we're talking and we're in proof of concept at the moment around an app. And this is looking at um, 
data drawn from the Met Office and other other groups. And it's really interesting looking at the, the way that yesterday. And I really appreciate the, uh, the input from that. Um, and, and it's just to see whether actually can we create some form of supporting information, not just the training material in point two, but uh, electronically that'll support responders. Uh, and back to the old nutmeg that we just need more. We don't know what we don't know. But we need more research on uh, survivability from drowning. Right, apologies, I'm running over slightly now as a result of that, my IT issues. So um, that was me and just a, a brief update with regard to where we are with the, uh, the development review of the submersion drowning tool. And it is submersion, not immersion, which is another key factor. Thanks, then. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, Mike Tipton from the Extreme Environments Laboratory at the University of Portsmouth. And... Um, a proud member of the International Drowning Researchers Alliance and the Physiological Society, both of which I recommend, again, that you go and have a look at. Um, so, um, we published this paper about a third of a century ago, Frank Golden and myself, and I thought it was probably time to revisit it briefly and see um, if there's any thing we can add to it or um, if there's any corrections we can make to some of the generalizations that have been made from it you've just heard a bit from leo on circumrescue collapse so i'll uh, that helps me um, with regard to the introduction so there's uh three areas post rescue during rescue and pre-rescue i'm going to take those in that sort of reverse order so when somebody's rescued um, there can be a problem with rewarming collapse that we've heard about and post immersion rescue collapse. Um, but the other thing to remember is that drowning is a process that can continue once somebody has left the water. So here's the x-ray of a 14 year old boy shortly after admission. Thanks to Frank Golden um, for this slide. Um, conscious chatting. Um, and there's the x-ray um, about an hour later. We're now unconscious and if this child had not been in an appropriate medical facility, his prospects would have been pretty poor because of the irritation that the salt water that went into his lung caused, the outpouring of fluid from the blood across the alveolar membrane and, uh, and his deteriorating um, condition. That leads to the conclusion that um, everyone suspected of aspirating water should be seen by a doctor. And we heard yesterday um, from Professor Tom about ways that you might be able to make that assessment early on um, admission to um, hospital. So we know from the review of the literature, one of which was recently done by David Spielman and colleagues in 2008 and 18, that there's no case in the medical literature of a patient who underwent clinical evaluation who were, and was initially without symptoms who deteriorated and died more than eight hours after the incident. So drowning can take up to four hours uh, uh, after an incident and uh, when you're out of the water, so watch for um, up to eight hours. I can hear my co-founders in Idra moaning about having a slide with secondary drowning on it because secondary drowning, near drowning, dry drowning all disappeared over 20 years ago. But it's still, uh, we still see it, particularly in the popular media. And at the bottom of this slide, there's some of the other conditions that are sometimes confused with um, delayed drowning. Just moving up then to during rescue. Um, this is a pretty well-known story now. This is collapse actually during the, the, the process of rescuing. And there are several conditions um, that contribute to that with somebody who's been in the water for some time. You then remove them from the water. They lose the hydrostatic support of the water. You reimpose gravity. They're probably hypovolemic by then because of a cold-induced diuresis, increased blood viscosity, poor coronary filling, cold myocardium, like any other muscle struggles when it gets cold, and can easily lead to hypertension, cerebral ischemia, myocardial ischemia, and a problem that can result in, in death. Um, the really important thing to remember about this, um, because it's been generalised to pretty much all scenarios, but the original work done by Frank Golden, um, one of the traces you can see here, um, as we go along at uh, the bottom of this time scale, you can see blood pressure. And you can see that during a vertical lift, there's a reduction in central venous pressure by 12 millimetres of mercury. 
the response to that is a baroreceptor response that helps maintain arterial pressure. So you don't see the collapse in arterial pressure that you would see if somebody was profoundly hypothermic had been in the water a long while. There's a clue in the picture, and that is this work was all done over protracted lifts. So these were helicopter winches that would take at least a minute or lifts up of high up high sided ships. Um, so the, the conclusion became to avoid rescue collapse or this collapse in arterial pressure. If the casualty is hypothermic, has been in the survival situation a long time and the airway is not under threat, don't start asking them to do work to get out of the water if they're near, near semi-conscious. Avoid vertical lifting and try and get people out of the water in a horizontal position. However, if the casualty is not hypothermic, has not been in the survival situation a long time and the airway is under threat, get them out as soon as you can. And some in some areas, the requirement for horizontal lifting has been generalized to every scenario. But the really important scenario for getting people out of the water horizontally is when they've been in the water a long while, they're hypothermic and their airway is not under threat. If they've not been in that long, and if they have um, not hypothermic and their airway is under threat, then get them. If you have to pull them by the ears, just get them out of the water. Um, Doing a horizontal lift in the situation we see here next to the sponson of a sponson of a rigid inflatable craft is more likely to increase the chances of drowning than it is to do anything beneficial for the physiology. In this situation, um, get somebody out of the water as quickly as you can. Horizontal is not best in all scenarios. When you place somebody in a rescue craft, remember that the problem here um, with a sudden collapse in blood pressure is a cardiovascular problem and how you orientate people in those crafts can make a difference to the blood, the venous return to the heart and therefore cardiac output and blood pressure. So if you're in a fast rescue craft, which tends to lift um, in the bow when it moves, then head towards the back of that. Helicopters that tend to dip forward as they move, head towards the front of that. Um, simple, simple, applied physiological input that comes from an understanding of what the problem is and in this case um, it's um, cardiovascular not um, drowning or respiratory so that leads me to the last uh, of the areas i want to talk a little bit about the pre-rescue collapse and this <laughs> is not an area that we can do any studies on whatsoever so inevitably um, what i'm going to talk to you about is speculative and hypothetical, um, but is based on deductive reasoning, which I would argue is as reasonable an approach as many others that people adopt. So we've had evidence for many years. Um, this comes from McNulty's service, uh, Medical Services in the War, 1946. A not uncommon feature observed in other waters as well as the Arctic was that many of the survivors who managed to get themselves to the point of being helped from the sea collapse when safety was within reach and required to be handled in the same manner as those who had been helpless in the water. So this is a, a sudden deterioration in the um, function of people in their, in their position uh, and status at the point of being rescued. Um, Paul Barney, who survived the Estonia um, capsize, fought for five and a half hours to get um, out of the upturned hull and onto an overturned raft. He was then winched up into the helicopter where he was conscious and smiling. And then a helicopter crewman reassured him of his safety. Paul became unconscious at the point of that reassurance. He says he consciously decided to let go. And so really what we want to know, um, this is a, 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 there, there are other examples from the laboratory. There are other examples from avalanche and other rescue scenarios. What's the mechanism of letting go and how can we avoid it? You've already seen um, this diagram from Leo, although you may not have seen the reference at the bottom, it's from Mike Shattuck and our um, review in 2012. And what we want to therefore just 
know is what's the psychophysiological impact of being rescued. The strong emotional mental stress when somebody's in a survival situation that's probably driving a fairly significant sympathetic drive uh, that activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal pathways. And we know that there are um, distinct patterns of autonomic nervous activity that are associated with emotion as well as physical stimulus, like we've heard about in terms of the cold shock response, as well as face immersions. And so we actually now think that probably the relief of a, the process of you about to being um, rescued uh, evokes some form of autonomic conflict. It may be a withdrawal of the sympathetic drive. It may be a vagal wave that changes the rhythm of the heart. So the autonomic nervous system, which normally modifies cardiac electri electrical activity on a moment to moment basis to maintain a normal heart rhythm, is suddenly changed by the realization, the relief that somebody is about to be rescued. Again, the real, the real beauty of applied physiology is you do your best to understand the basic physiology, um, but then this, the, the trick and the challenge is to interpret that physiology in a way that makes sense to those that have to apply it. And in this case, obviously, most of what I've talked about is about the search and rescue community. So the so what? How do we avoid um, pre-rescue collapse? Avoid comments like um, when you come to rescue somebody, um, relax, you're safe, we have you. Try and promote or encourage comments like we're here to help but keep fighting for your survival. What you're trying to avoid is that psychophysiological drive, which changes the balance between the autonomic uh, nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, and leads to um, a way, a vagal wave that can lead to cardiac problems and sudden collapse at the point of rescue. So I started with the question, death around the time of rescue, is drowning involved? The answer is yes, sometimes it is. It's a process that begins with ignorance in a community and continues for up to four hours after you leave the water. But it's really important that you consider also the cardiovascular consequences of what you say and what you do to a casualty at the point of rescue. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, g'day everyone, my name's uh, Steve Waterman. I'm from the Royal Life Saving Society of Western Australia. And I'm here today to talk about some river safety for First Nations uh, Australians. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into it. So I'm living in a remote Aboriginal community, which is about 3,000 kilometres uh, away from the nearest major city. So it's about a three day drive. So it's pretty remote up in the northern tip of Western Australia. Uh, if you've ever watched Crocodile Dundee, it looks kind of similar to that pretty much. So I've got some statistics to start with. Um, so Aboriginal Australians are about 1.7 times more likely to drown than non-Aboriginal Australians. And where I'm living at the moment in Western Australia is called the Kimberley region of WA. And in the Kimberley, rivers and creeks uh, are our second highest drowning rate. So river safety programs such as the one that I've been running uh, in the community, so the Warman community, I've been running for about three and a half, yeah, three and a bit years, been running this river safety program. And uh, yeah, programs like this are vitally important, uh, especially for Aboriginal Australians. And drownings um, overall in Australia, like 34% happen in rivers and creeks and dams or inland waterways. So the Kimberley River Safety Program is a program that it has two parts to it. So the, the first part is a safety talk. So what I'll do if I'm visiting a school is we'll either be in the classroom or down at, down at the river or down at the creek and uh, we'll have a, a safety talk. So one of the main things that we talk about is the dangers at the rivers and the creeks. So um, I would ask the kids, and this is a funny one, I'd say, oh, guys, you know, what's one of the dangers here at the creek? And because where we are, there's lots of crocodiles, they'll be like, crocodiles, crocodiles. So 
Uh, that, that is a bit of a danger up here is the, is the crocodiles. Um, but we talk about uh, submerged objects, what could be underneath that water. Uh, don't just go and jumping into it because there could be barbed wire, uh, animal carcasses, uh, things like that, fishing lines, hooks, all that type of stuff. So, and we like to discuss, uh, we call it the aqua code. So there's three parts to the aqua code. The first one is go together. So we try and tell, explain to the kids that if they go to a river or a creek that they really need to go with uh, like an adult or an older brother, sister, auntie and uncle, mum or dad. And then, then the second one is float. So if they do get into trouble, they can roll over, roll over onto their back and float. And then the last one that um, is part of that code is our reach to rescue. Um, we so I do bring down noodles, pool noodles to use as a as a tool for reaches. But we I do like to get some branches uh, and long sticks because that's pretty much what would be out there. So we like to train with branches and sticks as well. Um, so then after the aqua code. Uh, the other part of the talk would be the types of rescue. So the first one is we try and tell the kids if if they see one of their friends in trouble, the first thing they should try and do is, is, is maybe talk to them like, oh, come on, you know, come to me, kick to me type thing. Otherwise, we'll use our branches to reach. And then we've got our throws. So we do a lot of rope throws. Um, and we also take kickboards down to throw kickboards. But we also discuss uh, different types um, of a throw rescue, like using things that we could throw, um, like buoyancy aids, or um, the other one is we call it an esky, um, an esky lid. I suppose it's like um, what's the word, uh, like a cooler type box, and it's got a lid on it, so you can take that off and you can frisbee it in. And then the last part is our practical session. So that's when we take the kids. Down, down to the river or the creek and we do all the practical side of these things. So all the things that we've discussed, all our, all our types of rescues, our talk, our reach and our throw, is we, we actually go into that, we do a practical session. So um, the kids will practice talking, asking questions like that to try and get their friends to come in. Um, we do our reaches with noodles and branches and then we do our, our throws, so our kickboards, uh, and our rope so showing the kids how to how to wind up the rope and and throw it out and things like that so though those are the two main parts to the program in a nutshell um and we we've had some really really good results actually so from the time that i've been running these programs since 2020 uh and i've run them in four different locations in the kimberley region um, that there's actually been no no reported uh, instances of any fatal drownings. Um, so I'd like to think that the the kids are, are learning um, and they're doing the right thing by by going with with people and learning their skills and developing them as well. So uh, the the main thing for the program is is to be able to get the community members. Pardon me. Is to get the community members trained up in in basic water water rescue skills and and that water safety knowledge. So um, I do work with various stakeholders within the community to to run to help run these programs. Um, transport is a big thing. Uh, some of these waterways are are you know fifty kilometres plus uh, away and. Um, I do need help uh, to get the kids out there to, to some of these places. They are quite remote and uh, they do require a four wheel drive. So I, I do work with um, the community stakeholders, including the, the rec shed. So the rec shed is, um, it's, a, it's a youth program. So a recreational shed, I suppose they, it, it's called. And I work with the, the youth program manager in the, in the community to, to help organise transport for that, uh, which is a really, really big thing. Um, and also um, we use the, um, the CEO to help promote 
or, and also the, the chairperson and the council members in the community to help promote uh, water safety knowledge, not, not only at the, the swimming pool that I actually manage, um, but, but also when families do go out to the rivers and creeks that they, they know the basic knowledge of, you know, watching their kids and, and whatnot, uh, you know, supervision. Um, so the program, the, the Kimberley River Safety Program itself, it's, it's a very simple program. Um, you, you don't need a lot of equipment to actually be able to run one, um, but it will, it will teach the, the basic, basic rescue skills and, um, and, and, it will, and it will teach the kids about water safety as well. So I'm hoping that that program such as this uh, could be used um, in high risk countries, um, you know, uh, India, um, like South, Southeast Asian countries, uh, Africa, you know, where their drownings are actually quite high. Um, I believe, a, you know, a, a program like this could be beneficial for them in, in some way. Um, I know that Sri Lanka Life Saving Society is running some fantastic programs um, out there. Um, I've been following them on LinkedIn um, and they do some fantastic things there. Um, so, yeah, programs like this, I think, could be very beneficial um, in, in other high-risk drowning countries as it's, it's proving to be very beneficial here um, in, in a remote Aboriginal community. Um, I have delivered it not only for the community where I live at the moment, but I've, I have visited another two communities. One is about 30 kilometres away and another one is, is about 100 kilometres away. So um, they have been, yeah, shown to work out there as well. Uh, the, the kids love it. They have fantastic time doing it. Um, which I think is a really, really important thing when running these programs is you need to make them fun and engaging for the kids. Um, by having that, that fun, engaging factor there, the kids will want to keep doing it and come back for more. Uh, we, you know, the kids have been, been asking me, Steve, Steve, you know, when are we going to come, go, when are we going to go to Bow River and, and throw those ropes and, and do all that type of stuff again? So uh, it, it has been, yeah, working quite well, I believe. And um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's really good to see um, because yeah, the the levels of drownings for, for Aboriginal Australians or First Nations Australians is really quite high. So running programs like this, uh, not only in WA but over in the eastern states as well, I think is vitally important. Um, that that drowning is way too high, um, so we really need to to do something to combat that. And I believe that these programs are, are a fantastic way of doing it. Um, I think that's about it from me. Um, but please, if there's any questions, yeah, please please leave us some questions. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for having me. So it was, it was a little bit short. <laughs> um, the opportunity today is for me to share uh, on behalf of um, a couple of colleagues, um, Amy Peden and um, my, my uh, flood man, Adrian Mayhew a strategy that um, Adrian and uh, Adrian in the first instance and myself have uh, been promoting and, and urging for quite some time. Um, and um, I'll just get into the, the activity. I, I suppose um, um, having been uh, keen to uh, highlight and, and communicate to the, the wider um, drowning prevention community, the issues of flooding for some time, unfortunately, uh, as the more, longer we go on, um, the more severe it's getting. And, and um, it's quite timely in terms of this program, uh, th these couple of days to highlight that, for example, last month over 12 days, uh, as most of us are aware, and, and some of us may have all been, may have been impacted. There've been some major flood disasters um, all throughout uh, the globe from Greece, United States, obviously the Libya, um, Spain, Brazil, Taiwan, and that was all done over 12 days. Um, and there's also been other forms of flooding, perhaps not in the same category as some of those, but uh, there's no doubt it's, it's happening. And as we um, know from the science that a warmer planet increases the actual water holding capacity. So for every, um, as a lower atmosphere, for 
we see an increase of 7% for every one degree uh, of warming. So uh, 1.5, 1.4 degrees, obviously, uh, it's nearly one, one and a half. So we're up, up around the 10% mark. As, as some of us may know, warmer oceans increase the evaporation rates, which will make wet season wetter than usual. Uh, and, as, and that's what we're starting to see. A uh, warmer atmosphere will hold that moisture and changes indicate that the events will be more intense with warmer climate. Or if you prefer a graphic, uh, this is just a little graphic representation. So on the, on the left-hand side of the presentation, you can see what we've not had prior to the increase in temperature, uh, the pattern being that the evaporation of water into the atmosphere, uh, and then there was a and then some rainfall. But as you can see over on the right hand side, as that temperature increases, there's more water, more buildup in the water vapor, and of course more rainfall. And unfortunately, um, the consequences of that, uh, as we've seen uh, in those uh, re recent months, the damage to the infrastructure, the drowning, uh, is so significant, um, and it's something that uh, is not able to be stopped. It's just a fact of reality at the moment. Um, this is taken from uh, a flooding incident in, in, in Istanbul. And um, as you can see here by the support, uh, it looks like they're probably stretched. Even the fall fella on the right looks like uh, his fly has come a, a, a drifter uh, under, under pressure. And, um, and the clothing and the, um, their own uh, personal protection in general uh, is quite minimal. So. Uh, even this image creates uh, for some of us a, a, a very large concern also about the transmission of disease in this particular circumstance. And similarly, um, we have in this uh, example, this was from, um, I think, Brazil. So we've got a similar situation where someone's wading through who knows what sort of contaminant. Uh, we also know from the UN Sendai framework that since in the period 2005 and 2015, there's something like 700,000 lives lost, uh, 1.4 million people were injured, um, 23 million people made homeless to, with an estimated cost uh, of $1.3 trillion. So apart from the homelessness, there's also significant economic losses, downturn in business, um, loss of business completely. Um, and many countries are now working overtime to try and uh, find ways to mitigate against um, floodplain issues and, and that sort of thing. And, and in, in reality, the response can overwhelm the capacity of government agencies. In, in the Hunan uh, floods, for example, uh, the civil uh, authorities were totally overrun. And in the end, uh, there's a whole range of uh, community responses. And similarly, in um, New South Wales and in our country a couple of years ago. Uh, the lifeguards though are, are widely recognised for their drowning prevention skills and ability in rescue and resuscitation. So um, from our point of view, we know that, uh, and we, we've done some work with Australian and UK lifeguards, both in terms of training and also in terms of getting feedback from their uh, experiences and, and how they help. So we see that really as the untapped resource. It's the gem that hasn't been actually uh, installed into the crown just yet. So when we did the study um, of the lifeguards that have been involved, um, they'd, the sample that we used uh, had been, um, had participated in flood training. The flood training in, in factual facts was based on the UK model and um, covered uh, flood technician right through to uh, high level management and coordination. So it comprised 18 questions and we, we wanted to explore the demographics, the flood response experience and capacity, the individual perceptions of the lifeguards role in flood responsiveness and the organizational responses. Uh, while the uh, select group was quite small, um, we had 44 complete responses and there was two that um, we, we rejected because they weren't complete. Um, fairly uh, male dominated, uh, as you can see, and but that actually reflected the participants that had done the training. So, um, and they were not something that we had any control. Had a wide range group from the young as 22 through to 51 years of age. And in most cases uh, or across the board, the average ex years of experience was 16 years. So we're dealing with uh, quite a, a range of experienced practitioners. 
What we did learn and confirm from um, engaging with this group cohort was that um, we have acknowledge an, an, a range of transferable skills. The awareness of water conditions in general is much higher than the general public. The rescue and swimming uh, abilities obviously is something that's practiced and, and retrained uh, and refreshed each year. Um, the use and, and operation of rescue boats and crewing those boats, radio communication protocols and the use of ropes and rescue equipment. So all skills that are quite re relevant and uh, you know takes years of training. Uh, however, there was also recognition that uh, even from the experiences that were there, that there is a need to maintain and ensure that there is actually flood specific and swift water training to be made mandatory for volunteers. It's not it's not as directly transferable as simply outlining what uh, was raised in the first point, because there are other risks. Um, and there's also a different hydrology in terms of the flow of water when we're talking about flood water. Another point that has come up um, and you'll see uh, that reinforced from a further study we've done is that the need for cross-organisational collaboration is a massive challenge. And it's also one way that um, generally people view as being able to improve the coordination and the capacity um, in, in the case of a flood disaster. The other positive though that's come out of it is that there's basically a, an absolute willingness um, for those to become involved and, and contribute to that sort of emergency situation. Following that, um, we were able to take some of the expertise and capacity that we have and we conducted a workshop um, prior to the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in South Africa um, back in 2018 and um, 2017 actually, I think. Um, and we had a number of countries represented in the workshop. We were then invited to uh, provide a short uh, presentation into the main program. And uh, as a consequence of that, Life Saving South Africa um, asked us if we could further uh, the training and the educational uh, activity uh, for the, the, the community. So we engaged in uh, providing a series of webinars uh, and that was hosted and, and communicated through Life Saving South Africa. Um, generally out of the four webinars, our participation rate was 60 to 70 people at each, each forum. And uh, significantly, um, South Africa has a massive uh, challenge uh, in terms of human and, and economic loss and has done uh, for quite some time since they've been keeping records. The annual flood risk in that country is at about 83%. Um, and as an example, in 2022, um, flooding claimed the lives of 443 people and, and displaced a further 40,000 people when their flood homes were swept away by floodwaters. So those sorts of figures uh, alone uh, co are cause for concern. The flood mitigation response in South Africa is a, is a challenging due to the range of environmental infrastructure and policy constraints. There's a number of areas that have very poor quality housing. Uh, a lot of them are situated in very flood plain areas. Uh, there's also issue with drainage in terms of blockages, which actually uh, contribute to further damage. But um, like uh, similar to the UK and Australian experience, the, the lifeguard uh, services and uh, organization in South Africa uh, is does provide an opportunity for a, a further strengthening of the capacity to respond in flood situations. So we took the work that was done through those webinars and and researched and asked questions of the participants. And really what we were trying to find out is in terms of what they wanted and could see and, and uh, feel in terms of their own needs, in terms of flood situations and responses. So we completed some online surveys. We got some pre and post um, feedback from the four workshops. Um, we also encouraged free text responses that were thematically coded uh, in terms of their knowledge about floods um, and also their experience and training and capacity. Um, out of those, uh, we analyzed 68 responses um, Pre-workshop phases there, we had 60% 60, 60 male roughly, um, and the age group was 50 to 59. I think I've left out the female, so I do apologise there. Um, I think that was probably in between the 
program here. The challenges uh, in flood mitigation and response were identified, and particularly including equipment training and a lack of government support. So uh, some similar themes that have come from, obviously, uh, the two areas in Australia and UK are reflected even in uh, the situation where there's limited um, capacity or limited, sorry, uh, practice from the life-saving, lifeguarding community. However, uh, again, we found that there was a, a strong willingness to assist um, with good cooperation, actually, with other African countries across the regions. So not only could the potential here be in South Africa, but also in neighbouring countries. So there are huge opportunities for better cross-municipal and government communication. So in terms of uh, the discussion, um, there are, uh, obviously, this is a summarised version of uh, our work, but um, it, it is ongoing. Um, and uh, even here in the um, setting of the WHO and the rescue and resuscitation workshop that, we're, that I'm involved with at the moment, flood rescue and flood training has uh, been uh, at the forefront in a number of the presentations. So uh, obviously, Unfortunately, or obviously, the, the longer it goes on, it is getting worse and so is the demand. So we see that um, all our time and effort is starting to actually perhaps have some impact. Um, we know that uh, in resource poor settings, the ability of water safety prof professionals can actually bolster uh, significantly the flood mi mitigation response. There are opportunities to exist that, to harness this willingness. Um, we need to encourage and improve cross-government and municipal knowledge um, in how they can reach out and share to improve that flood mitigation and response efforts. And drowning is a significant cause of mortality and morbidity during floods. The flood mitigation response is challenging in South Africa, as it is in many and many other countries. And upskilling lifeguards may assist um, existing communities uh, without having to um, put an extra drain in terms of their resources. So the example and the examples um, was, was enlightening because they'd all had the opportunity to engage in the webinars. They all had opportunities to ask questions. Uh, we had some um, pre-session pre, uh, speakers from within South Africa. So they also helped to set the scene and confirm what sort of infrastructure and what sort of challenges they had. Uh, so overall, the online training was well received, but obviously um, we found, and, and it was quite clearly communicated, was uh, when are we coming to back and when are we going to offer the training in a hands-on uh, manner? Uh, of course, uh, coming from uh, the UK and Australia, it's not easily achieved, but um, the world is opening up and perhaps uh, that they'll find some way. And as I said, uh, water safety professionals slash volunteers are able to assist and, um, and there's no reason uh, that that can't be facilitated. However, I guess the, the final message um, that I'd like to perhaps share is that it's an urgent situation and it's critical to anticipate. We need to plan for and reduce the disaster risk in order to more effectively protect the people, our communities, our countries, their livelihoods, their health, their cultural heritage, the socio-economic assets and ecosystems, and thus strengthen their own resilience um, as we face whatever's uh, coming for us. So that's a thank you for me, uh, from me for your time. And I've uh, included a couple of QR codes, which actually take people to those papers, Jenny, if uh, they want some light reading. Um, so hello everyone. Yeah, my name is uh, Ben Sharp. Um, recently finished my PhD, um, working under Jenny Smith, uh, Marcus Smith from University of Chichester, and Steve Williams from King's College of London. And then I've had various collaborators from RLSS UK, RLNI, and uh, Imperial College London, working with um, uh, Adam Hampshire and his team. So today I'm going to talk about the final study of my PhD thesis, uh, just to give you a, a very quick visual kind of recap of my uh, PhD, um, a series of seven studies of which study seven I'll be talking about today. And this is where I'm really focusing on a lifeguard specific uh, drown detection uh, training task that I generated that is relatively simplistic in nature, but 
I deemed it to be necessary uh, based on the current types of lifeguard training that are currently out there. So moving away from specific lifeguard uh, scanning tools or scanning strategies and instead focusing on some of the core principles of which a lifeguard faces within their given role. And this can translate both to beach and pool size, but I'll speak about that a bit later. So initially, just to give you a walkthrough of what I developed, uh, I generated a animated task. So this task allowed me to manipulate aspects such as bathing number, drowning durations, drowning locations and time. The most critical reason why I developed this task alongside uh, the collaborative team was because generating real time footage within pool scenarios is inherently difficult and isn't necessarily uh, ethically viable, such as asking people to hold their breath for 90 seconds in the water. Also gaining a population within a poolside or beach where there's minimal distractions externally, such as boats or changes in weather conditions, wind conditions and so forth. I deemed it to be more uh, appropriate for laboratory settings to generate an animated tool. And I can talk about the validity of that tool a bit later. Just to give you a visual demonstration on one of the variants of the animated tool of which we teamed uh, bobbing along in the publications associated, participants saw something as follows. A series of bathers swimming in a localized pattern of which was unbeknownst to the participants. And then every five minute interval, again, unknown to the participant, a bather submerged gradually. And again, we adjusted things such as how long it took them to drown. From this, it allowed us to have a look into our initial findings. And the main finding was really directed on what is the critical role of a lifeguard. And that is not just to detect the prevalence of uh, drowning and then respond accordingly, but it's also inherently a vigilance task. And by vigilance, I'm referring to a task that happens over an extended period of time. Within RLSS recommendations alone, the recommendation typically is about 30 to 60 minutes on a pool side, and in some instances up to 90 minutes. This is inherently a difficult task, not just for lifeguards, but any human to take part in. I'm sure even instances of listening to some of the presentations today, your mind might have wandered without your conscious control. So from that, I looked into our initial uh, study and across all the PhD, we've probably tested just over 400 active lifeguards. And what I seem to find is that over an extended period, a period of um, focusing your attention towards the animated task, attention seemed to decline accordingly. As I've mentioned, every five minutes um, a drown occurred. And here you can see at each individual one of these drown events, the percentage likelihood of a lifeguard detecting these drowning events seemed to decrease as time progressed. Around the 25, 30 minute period, um, performance declined so rapidly that it was below the 50% of individuals were detecting someone drowning. So that highlighted a really critical point to me is that Within the manuals alone, it seems to be the case that simply passing a lifeguard qualification, so you would then be a novice, it doesn't seem to be enough to prepare you for this vigilance task of which a lifeguard takes part in on every single shift. So I tried to explore a bit further on how to push a training uh, protocol to try and expose them to these uh, events within the context of an extended period. Again, one of the key highlights here is that this initial point that you can see circled demonstrates the first 20 to 11 minutes of typical tasks you find in lifeguard literature. And this seems to be where the majority of lifeguard focused literature directing toward dran detection performance seems to stop. They have very short duration tasks and then look into dran detection performance. And just looking at these three different data points, this is uh, in line with the plethora of research that has occurred since 2011 up until today, of there being key differences between experts, so those that have been lifeguards for 100 months or more, or novice, if, uh, novice or naive uh, individuals, so those that have never had any lifeguard training. And yeah, the, the key data points here conform to prior literature. However, the one aspect that doesn't seem to be discussed often, and hopefully the conversation can increase more rapidly, is what happens after about this 30, 40 minute period where performance seems to be declined to a standpoint where drowning events seem to be missed quite heavily. 
A question that I thought I would answer uh, related to this animated tool was how ecologically valid is it? I actually ran a validation study to compare my animated task against a real world counterpart. And fortunately I found similar findings to prior. So performance declines over time. Uh, the tasks in this setting were both 30 minutes. And then I achieved external validity, meaning the participants performed equally in both tasks. So if they detected only five out of the 10 possible drowns in the animated task, they seemed to mirror um, relatively similar mean values. They weren't exceeding a standard deviation. So this moves us on to the lifeguard specific training task of which I'll be focusing on just the one strand for today's presentation. But the point was, I'm going to get a series of individuals, 16 per different groups, to take part in a baseline measurement, which was that real world um, image you saw in the previous slide. And then I'm going to train them on my animated tool. And all that the training consisted of was demonstrating varying different bather numbers to lifeguards, varying different drown durations, and the task was repeatedly 60 minutes in length. So it really gave the participants some indication of, is your mind wandering? Is your attention being um, directed towards internal thought? Are you daydreaming? Are you actually focused on the task at hand? The only direction I provided lifeguards was a pause after a drowning event had occurred, and I pointed out the drowning event. So this really provided participants with some self-regulation of their uh, attentional strategy. They were aware of the fact they may or may not have missed a drowning event. And then once I pointed out the drowning event, they had the opportunity to internally reflect on what was happening during that period. Were they looking in the wrong location of the pool? Were they not adopting a particular strategy that was most comfortable for them? Were they fatigued by the task at hand? And hopefully that could have led them to some form of a training benefit. Once the training uh, period ended, which was a four week period, I retested them on that real world task to provide the outcome metrics of their drown detection performance total and their performance over time. So what we seem to found, and only look at the uh, LST here, which is a lifeguard specific training, I found that there seemed to be a 29% increase in performance. However, the other group, so the cognitive training group, which I won't get into, and the control variant didn't seem to have any statistical increase in performance or in some cases, there was even a decline. So what this demonstrated was a few things. There's value in displaying numerous drown scenarios. For those of you that have gone through uh, lifeguard specific training yourself, there isn't necessarily any direct focus or even uh, extended footage associated with drown detection performance. There's limited exposure to uh, different drown scenarios in terms of location and the impact that sustained attention can have on your own performance. So this intervention wasn't um, flashy. It was simply exposing them to different drown scenarios, behaviors and over an extended period of time and hoping that participants would take into account their own um, flaws or limitations associated with their attentional strategies. So it might be assumed that participants were suddenly aware of the fact they do daydream they may be more aware that they do have an intentional deficit issue related to extended durations, or they might even consider things such as I'm not well hydrated, I've not eaten appropriately, or the room is too hot and therefore providing a distraction. So there's lots of different key factors that might negatively asso be associated with sustained attention. However, at minimum, I seem to demonstrate within this small scale training program that exposure to drowning scenarios alone, even if it is an animated task, seem to have some transfer over to a pool scenario. However, the one caveat I will make here is that the animated task does have a lack of um, a variation that you would might expect in a pool or beach scenario, such as ships, changing weather conditions, etc. So it is a, as controlled as possible uh, experimental design. However, there is ongoing research that uh, Jenny Smith is also leading, which will be spoke about to the, um, the World Drown Prevention Conference in the coming months, that hopefully those that attend do find that particularly interesting. And then the last note is that we did a four week retention to see without any form of training, do they retain some of the performance benefits from this training intervention? And excitingly, it seemed to be the case that 
uh, those that were retested and volunteered to return to the laboratory seem to retain this performance advantage. So hopefully this is something that there can be continued discussion and research associated to generate relatively simplistic interventions into our lifeguards. Um, finally, out of the seven uh, studies, all of which are under review, two have recently been published. So please feel free to uh, have a read. Hopefully you find them particularly interesting. And then if you'd like to follow me on Twitter for um, any open conversation, or even if you'd like to email me, feel free to scan the link. But otherwise, um, I look forward to answering any questions if you have any. And yeah, thank you again, everyone, for letting me talk. Thank you. Um, and thank you for letting us speak um, at this conference. Um, my name is Carly McAvoy and joining me is uh, Station Commander James Sullivan. And we're here to talk about the Drowning and Incident Review. Um, and from now on, we'll refer to that as DIR. Um, and we're just going to give you some background and then talk about our initial insights. So if you were here yesterday, you would have seen that I talked about this number. So Scotland is a devolved nation within the United Kingdom. We have about 5.5 million people. Um, but sadly, each year we have about 96 fatalities on average, um, 50 of which are accidental, which, which gives us a sort of accidental drowning rate of about 0.82, which... Uh, for a European country is quite high and it is certainly much higher than our UK neighbours such as England who have much much less. So the important thing to sort of grasp um, as part of this is that 20 of the uh, fatalities that we see every year we have unknown outcomes so we, we don't know the outcome we don't know if it was an accidental fatality we don't know if it was a suspected suicide um, and this is actually quite high in comparison to other countries and it's really a unique challenge that we have with the data capture in Scotland and if you're interested there's a QR code that will take you to a report that goes into this in depth but all you really need to know is that the legal system in Scotland is, is kind of overseen by what is called the Procure Fiscal um, and they oversee all the investigations into fatalities in Scotland. And without getting into detail, it basically means that what we call a fatal accident inquiry, which in other countries is like an inquest, uh, very rarely happens in Scotland. So there is just lots of information around drowning fatalities that we just don't know. Um, basic things, as I said, about outcomes, sometimes even sex, age, all these sort of things. We just have no information about them. So to try and overcome this issue, um, because as you can imagine, it's quite difficult to prevent um, future fatalities if, if we don't know what's causing them in at least 20 of our cases, we created through Water Safety Scotland, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and, and ROSPA, the DIR. I don't know if the slides moved yet. I'll just, I'll keep going. There we go. Um, thank you. And you'll see on your screen here um, that, that DIR is a process and let me be clear that it's for accidental water related fatalities only but it's a process that aims to gather data and, and look at the contributory factors of an incident um, in order to help gain a better understanding of how to prevent future incidents and it can be used for fatal incidents in both inland and coastal waters but it can also be used for near miss incidents um, as long as they've been attended by emergency services or they've been reported. Um, importantly, it does not cover boating and commercial incidents, death by suicide, death in employment or death where crime is suspected, because these are all covered by other legal processes in Scotland. Um, and they're led, the DIR is led by Water Safety Scotland and lead SAR organisations. So in terms of what DIR, um, I don't think, not what it covers, but what the benefits of DIR is that we see Nationally, we are able to get previously unavailable information. Um, Wade has been talked about yesterday, if you were if you were around, but we get this un unavailable. We get information that we've never been able to have before, which is uh, so so useful for us nationally to look at how we can better work locally and better um, adapt to new um, and different uh, circumstances of fatalities, which is really useful. It helps better inform our national strategy. Um, due to the enhanced data, but really importantly, we found that locally partners gain really good insight into the risks in their area. We know that we have the best people placed to address the risks and be kept informed and utilize it and um, because they are the ones on the ground working there. And we also know that their local knowledge can be employed to ensure that we have improved water safety outcomes as a result of a DIR. 
So next slide um, is just uh, very briefly before I pass over to James to talk about um, our initial insights. It's just really quickly how it works. Um, there is a guidance document, but it's been created to work with local groups. Um, and essentially when a fatality occurs in Scotland, um, within a time scale, time scale agreed by our local sort of groups and our lead search and rescue, um, we hold what is called a scene and outcome review meeting. And this is typically led by our lead SAR organizations such as police or fire. Um, and this review essentially just makes sure that the initial scene is safe, that there's no further risk to life. And then it looks at um, triggering the DIR process um, by deciding what the likely outcome is. So during that meeting, the outcome will be classified as suspected accidental or suspected suicide, et cetera, et cetera. At this point, it then goes through a process with Water Safety Scotland and is checked by the Procurer Fiscal, who will then decide whether DIR progresses. So when DIR is progressed, we enter a phase of evidence gathering, which James will take you through a little bit more of the kind of information that we, we gather. But essentially that's all put together into a consistent sort of package and we, we host and hold what is called the DIR meeting where we bring all the national and local agencies and professionals together to discuss the incident in a lot of depth. But really importantly as well, this is where we make decisions on um, recommendations and future mitigations that could have potential to prevent similar incidents in the future. Um, and then finally, we do audits of the data, um, or we plan to, because it is a new process, um, and the data is, is stored uh, within legal requirements. So I'm going to pass over to, to James now to take over for the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Carleen. So during the, the DIR meeting that Carleen has uh, just described there, there's a clear narrative of the events leading up to the incident are presented to the partners, and we do that using animated maps, agency narratives, photographs of the location that include elements such as signage, public rescue equipment, the terrain, and other features relevant to the incident. So this presentation of information will enable the attendees to gain a firm understanding of the incident and the location, even if they've never been there at any point themselves. So we also look at contributory factors such as the weather, the depth of the water, location features, the activity being undertaken, as well as factors relating to the person, such as their age, gender, ethnicity, and any potential contributory factors such as alcohol use or known mental health issues, etc. So DIR was extensively piloted and evaluated with uh, limitations and supports outlined, and there's a link to this paper on the screen just now that you can um, look at if you wish. So DIR was launched in May of 2023 and has now been running for approximately six months. So some of the key points regarding the implementation are as follows. So we have full search and rescue buy-in, we've procured a fiscal buy-in, and we have government buy-in. Partners have all recognised the need for improved data and coordination in the efforts to improve water safety interventions, and we were fully behind a consistent review process. Water Safety Scotland is an overarching organisation that's responsible for DIR, and this allows for local variances in terms of who instigates and runs a review, but with that national consistency through Water Safety Scotland that ensures uniform reviews throughout the country, regardless of who takes on that role of lead search and rescue. There is an extensive guidance document for anyone who will use DIR, as well as online training packages, and this training is available to anyone who wishes to learn more about DIR, and that's available via the Water Safety Scotland website. In regards to training, Carleen and I have assisted the lead search and rescue organisations with specific and tailored training and coaching, and this was to ensure that they have the confidence and experience to run a DIR with minimum Water Safety Scotland support. And we're actually now seeing some of the partners taking the lead on delivering a DIR with Water Safety Scotland able to take a supporting role rather than a lead role in the delivery of the review. So the results are that we have captured all drowning fatalities in Scotland since May of this year. The preliminary outcome data, which is known as the Scene and Outcome Review, or SAW, has been captured in 100% of incidents in Scotland since that day. Around 50% of these incidents have met the DIR progression criteria, with a number of those reviews already taking place, and the remaining incidents are currently within the evidence gathering phase for delivery in the very near future. 
Insights have already provided never before captured data on activity, geographic risks, and contributory factors. Control measures put in place include school engagement, community engagement, targeted social media campaigns to raise awareness, consideration of public rescue equipment and safety signage via landowner risk assessments. Also from the, the piloting phase, we know of lives being saved. On the Water Safety Scotland website, we have a case study called Julie's Story. And Julie's story tells of a woman cycling through a country park when she's alerted to three young girls in difficulty in a nearby river. So Julie was able to safely intervene and use equipment and follow safety guidance placed within this known high-risk area as a result of this prevention process. And I'm happy to say that the three young girls were rescued without injury from a location that has claimed far too many lives in the past. So in summary, DIR is a sustainable and pioneering process which gathers relevant data and intelligence in relation to a drowning incident or near miss. The learning from its creation, its use and the recent improvements may be helpful to other countries who aspire to create a similar process. And future research should consider how DIR can be adapted for use in other settings, as well as how the data from DIR relates to risk analysis and drowning statistics. And that concludes uh, our presentation on DIR. And I'm sure that Caroline and I will both be happy to take any further questions on the process later on in the meeting.